Okay, good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and uh, get the webinar going. Um, I am uh, Rob, uh, Technology Services Director with Vista IT Group, and we also have John Bushart uh, from Ingram Micro, which is one of our strategic distributors, to talk about uh, Nimble today. And before we get into some of the content, a uh, couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to send those over uh, via the chat or the Q&A, and we will get to those questions at the end. And we will also, uh, again, offer a little bit of time to um, um, ask additional questions there. Uh, there will be a post-webinar survey that will go out when you close out the Zoom meeting, and you will be entered into kind of a raffle for a $300 gift card. That feedback is really important to us, so we'd appreciate it if you could uh, take a few minutes and do that. We are also recording the webinar, so if you need to leave halfway through or if you have a colleague that wasn't able to make it, uh, there'll be a link to that webinar once uh, I think the, the next day we'll send it out. Okay, a uh, quick intro to Vista if you're kind of a um, little new to um, working with us. Uh, we've been in business 33 years. Last year we shipped uh, 25,000 orders and we're serving over 8,000 customers across four continents, uh, located right here in West Michigan. So um, uh, we, we do have a, a pretty far reach and, and quite a number of capabilities. So our three core competencies are data center, supply chain, and technology services. So what we're gonna be covering today with the Nimble falls pretty squarely into our data center competency, uh, as well as if you need some services for implementation, migration, disaster recovery planning, things like that, we can help out. But we've also got some pretty cool things that we can do with supply chain, uh, life cycle management, um, and, and things like that. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to John to talk about Nimble Storage. Hello, everyone. I'm John Bussart. I'm an HPE uh, Solution Center engineer. Um, I focus in on HP server storage networking technologies that are out there. Um, my main purpose in life is to learn as much about HP technologies and preach them to the world. So I run a data center um, uh, for HP, and I can actually, we're going to be talking from a high level today, but if, if you enjoy what you see today, you want to learn more, you can certainly reach out to Rob and the rest of his team, and we can actually schedule a more in-depth view into these products or even if you wanted to get hands on with these technologies, we're more than willing to be able to help you with that. So, so today we're going to talk about HPE's Nimble Storage. Um, it certainly represents the next generation of storage that's out, that's out there. Um, now, as we talk about next generation storage, I think it's important to talk about uh, flash disks or SSD disks. Certainly, um, that's a lot of the reason why people are reevaluating. Um, certainly, this new technology is exciting. Um, but just because you have faster and faster disks out there, doesn't necessarily our uh, regular everyday storage requirements hasn't changed so certainly we need storage that's high performance in SSD and and and, and flash certainly uh, provides that but we also need scalability not only scalability as far as uh, uh, um, the amount of uh, storage that we have but also the performance that we have right and as we scale this we don't want to lose the reliability and that, that actually goes down to be able to build disaster recovery strategies actually we want to build disaster recovery strategies that that doesn't hit our pocket book significantly. Okay. As we rely on these storage systems uh, to, to, you know, drive our business, um, you know, we're, we're driving deeper and deeper into the applications that, that, that make us profitable. And certainly we want to have um, serious app integration with these applications to make our jobs a lot easier. We want drive efficiency. We expect the, the solution to last its life cycle without any issues. We want uh, data mobility and easy use. So, so we want a, an interface that's very easy to use and manage. We don't want to be a rocket scientist in order to be able to manage this. And also, if we're going to put our data in there, you know, we don't want our data to live and die in whatever we place it on. We want data to be mobile and be able to be moved around within our environment. So even though the storage is getting faster and faster, right, out there, and, and, and nobody can certainly deny that. If you've bought a laptop within the last few years, certainly if it has an SSD drive, it has a significant impact as far as performance is concerned. So we want that within our environment. But let's not lose, you know, the, the, the idea of, of the other technologies, the other reasons why we're purchasing this solution within our environment. 
and certainly Nimble is going to have, help across the board with all these technologies. Now, now Nimble has a new storage system that's out. Um, it represents the latest generation of their technologies, and these are the pillars that are listed below. So first off, it's on the next generation of hardware. So certainly, you know, the controllers with this, this system are, are, are higher performing, you know, more processing power, more cores, and things like that. And they also have more cash within them. And what they're saying is, is all flat, uh, the all flash platform can deliver up to uh, 220 uh, times uh, better performance percent performance uh, price per performance increase per, as opposed to previous generations of storage. Right? With this extra horsepower inside the environment, we have the ability to do do other things. Um, and now we have the ability to do inline, always on deduplication on adaptive flash arrays. So, so let's start off the conversation about adaptive flash arrays. Certainly, I would focus in on an all SSD based solution, an all flash based solution inside your environment. But sometimes, obviously the highest performance storage certainly has a, a price kind of wrapped around it. If you need to get most of that performance in your environment, but you don't want to spend all that money, you might want to look at an adaptive flash array. An adaptive flash array has spinning disk with just enough SSD drives in it to augment the performance in the environment. And you can get about 80 to 90% of the performance that you would get of an all flash system by mixing these two technologies together within a nimble storage array. Its, it's architecture is designed to be able to provide maximum performance and not rely on the spinning disk for moments in order to be able to maintain um, access to your data within the environment. So that's what adaptive flash arrays are. In the previous generations, and with all Nimble arrays, we've had the ability to have compression on. Right. In the last generation of arrays, we've had the ability to have compression and deduplication on flash disks, but the spinning disk and SSD is just a hybrid flash system or the adaptive flash systems didn't have that ability until now. Now we have the ability to do uh, compression as well as deduplication on these systems. And also, we have a store more guarantee. So you're going to buy a storage solution, and it's going to have a certain set of raw capacity on it. Store more guarantee gives you the ability to use more storage than what the raw capacity is right and we're willing to wrap our our, our our money where our mouth is it's just not marketing material right right so so we have the ability to guarantee a certain amount of capacity that gets used in that in your environment right a certain amount of capacity excuse me gets utilized above and beyond raw within your environment and and how do we do that so certainly uh, before any of the data reduction technologies, we have a more elegant layout as far as uh, the OS uh, RAID and sparing of data inside the environment. So I find a lot of people who like nimble storage technologies are, are the server administrators that maybe adopted virtualization, and then they knew with virtualization they need some type of shared storage to really do anything cool, but they didn't necessarily want to get into the minutia of configuring RAID levels, different set sizes, and things like that within a storage system. They just wanted it to perform the best that it could for their virtualized workload. I think uh, Nimble fit, fits great in there. It's an easy to use live environment. You're not going to get into the niche of creating different RAID levels based on different performance. The storage is designed to be able to perform you know, RAID as it, it kind of sits. So with that in mind, you usually get about 20% work capacity out of the storage to begin with, and then we layer on our data reduction technologies. So first we use deduplication. So I don't know if you in, in your environment, if you like this PowerPoint and you received it and you shipped it out to, to a great many people within your organization, that would represent a great many copies of that that would exist within your email server. Right. If that email server was sitting on Nimble technology, it would look up and see all that duplicate data and consolidate that down to a single space. And that's what deduplication does within the environment. After that, we will layer on compression. All right, so they use math algorithms, kind of squeeze it down and make it smaller without impacting performance within the environment. So that's important. So, so compression, I'll usually explain that as kind of like you ever get a zip file from somebody or, or, and you, you extract it on out and generally the files are bigger than what the zip file was, right? That's throwing your data through through a math algorithm to shrink it on down, right? And certainly we do that with our data reduction technologies. And finally, zero block elimination. This is the ability to look upward into your volume and see where data is not being used or where no data exists, be able to capture back that space to the storage system. So a good example of that is more often than not, server administrators will over-provision their servers to the tune of 80%, right? We don't ever run, or run into a situation we don't have enough space to be able to put our, our business critical data on. So we oversize the volumes considerably. We may not be using that space, but we don't ever want to get caught in kind of, kind of that scenario. 
right? It's like, it's like buying a laptop for yourself. You want to you buy a laptop and you purchase it with enough space that'll hold all your movies, all your, all your, your, your uh, music and all your pictures on it. You don't ever want to run and say, when we talk about that in a, in a business context, right? We lose money if we don't have this place to store our, our information. All right. So, so zero block elimination. So this would be buying storage that you need today at today's prices and the storage you need tomorrow at tomorrow's prices. Obviously the price per gigabyte, no matter what that storage technology will look like, it comes down over time. So with this, you know, you may be able to provision a one terabyte volume for a server, but if the data in the operating system only take, take maybe 200 uh, gigs at this point in time, only 200 gigs, actually a little bit less on the storage system, but to keep the math kind of easy, we'll say only 200 gigs will get used on the back end storage, leaving the rest of the space to be able to be there to be used by other services and, and out there. And you're not stuck in any corner. If you need to expand, you're going to call your friends at uh, Vista IT and you're going to buy some more storage capacity and you're going to add that environment. Okay. So after data reduction, they're saying you can see on average, people see about five times uh, more uh, effective capacity with the environment. That would say for every one terabyte you purchase on a Nimble system, right, odds are you're probably going to get about five terabytes of store utilized storage within the environment. So you're kind of getting something um, a little extra w within your environment. Right. And certainly HP is willing to wrap its its money where its mouth is. They'll come in and evaluate your environment. The IT will come in and evaluate your environment. And if they are telling you you're going to get a certain efficiency rating rating in your environment, right? You're going to get that. And if you don't get that, HP is going to give you free hardware. So if you're evaluating any other competitors out there, say, hey, if your marketing slides don't stand up for what they're saying, don't give me the the effective uh, data reduction ratings that you say, right? Will you give me free hardware and you'll find that that other people are unwilling to allow some those type of things so some other things i think are important to talk about nimble systems so it's absolutely about resiliency in your environment you need access to your data and we can actually measure through infosight and i'll talk a little bit about infosight infosight's a cloud-based analytics but we'll save that a little bit more for the end but we can actually tell by pulling in telemetry from all the storage systems that are out there that customers are getting on average six nines of availability that is 99.9999 percent availability of your data within your environment all right, so that's a tremendous amount of availability, and we have the numbers to be able to prove that. Also, we're protecting your data through triple parity plus rate is what we call it, uh, triple plus parity. So that's the ability to lose three disks at any given time within a storage shelf, and your data would still stay available in the environment. And doing the tiering architecture or the cache architecture, you'll see minimal performance impact if that ever happens, if you ever happen to lose three disks in that environment. On top of that, we have integrated data protection. Now, some people will say that's snapshots, and I'll certainly will, will not argue that, but these are snapshots without performance hits inside the environment. So you have the ability to take snapshots as often as you want, more frequently in your life, to re reduce recovery point objectives within your infrastructure. Also, there's third-party software that actually reach into these snapshots and be able to provide you instant virtual machine recoveries if you want to go down that route. And finally, if you need it, if you have a need for encryption to make sure your data doesn't get stolen by third-party entities for one reason or another, encryption comes on the system at zero cost add-on. All right. Some other things that, that, that are zero cost in, inside the environment is replication between arrays. So this is the ability to maybe set up a site-to-site -site replication strategy. Or if I have my data at one site, I'm going to take the, the, the information that exists within the storage system and on an ongoing basis, basis have a copy to another storage array or another site that exists out there. And we can do this at a lower cost. Right? So we do this without additional licenses. So you don't have to buy anything edge, extra on top of that. So that's important um, we also can do it between dissimilar arrays so maybe at your, your main site you have an all flash array you've evaluated that would work great inside your environment right and you want to build a business continuity strategy well you can look at the adaptive flash arrays or the hybrid flash arrays at the secondary site and again have, on an ongoing basis have your data copied from the main site to the secondary site so if something critical happened at your main site a fire natural disaster or something like that you could go to your secondary site and have access to your data over there All right so we have the ability to do that um, you could also grow into a business continuity strategy so say you adopt nimble today you deploy that within your environment and you use it for years and years and years to come right and you're evaluating maybe you know 
later on, uh, a newer generation of nimble storage system, you could take your older storage system and move that to a secondary site and replicate between those storage systems. So these storage systems don't even need to be of the same generation, right? So you can use the technology by today, tomorrow for, for your business uh, disaster recovery strategy. So it can be dissimilar arrays, either this generation or last generation, right? And you can create this, this environment. Another piece that we have is quality of service. Again, this is free, no additional licensing for this. So today, if uh, the database administrator comes to you or, or anybody who, who needs storage within their environment, they say, hey, give me so many terabytes worth of storage, I need to support this business critical application. And just for our example, let's say the Oracle administrator comes into you and says, hey, I need this volume and, and I, I, you know, to be able to support this, this, this database inside the environment. So you go back in the storage system, you carve it out, you give it to that person, and they start utilizing it. Obviously, a database is, is a pretty can be a pretty significant impact as far as storage in your environment. Uh, those can grow pretty large, right? And we'll say that that user, that that administrator, starts to use their lion's share of the performance within the storage system, right? Having an impact on other applications within the environment. With the quality of service that you find within Nimble Storage, you have the ability to go into that application and limit its performance based on IOPS or, or throughput inside that environment, or or pulling back a little of the performance, not reducing their capabilities, right, but making sure it doesn't necessarily have any impact on any of the other applications that are out there. I also like to look at this as a way of doing chargeback as well. Today, a lot of people, if they're doing chargeback to different departments, they'll charge per gigabyte or per terabyte, right? And then they'll, you know, if somebody needs that size, to go back to the ledger and say, this is how much it costs per terabyte, and they'll do that chargeback. But they don't have any chargeback mechanism based on, on performance. Quality of service allows you to kind of set that up. You could have maybe a, a uh, bronze, silver, and gold tier that you could present to users that want storage in the environment, and you can do chargeback based on that. And if somebody happens to, to be um, a, a little aggressive, maybe they buy at the bronze tier and they realize they don't have the performance, it's very simple and easy to be able to change them and move them maybe from a bronze tier to a silver tier, and then a gold tier. And again, you can go back to your ledger and kind of change you know, what your charge them as far as chargeback is concerned. So it allows you to do chargeback um, as, you know, above and beyond just storage capacity. And also maybe it allow you to do test and dev on the same as array as a production, right? Because you don't want any runaway application to ha have any effect on anything that's in production. We'll now have the ability to put a, a wrapper around that to make sure that they don't, don't have any runaway process that'll have an impact. Right, so, so let's talk about some of the different arrays. First, we'll talk about the all flash array or the AF series. Um, so this is, is certainly will represent your, your highest performing workloads that are out there. Now, so what we're looking at on the screen is what I would consider the, the head unit. So the system will have two controllers and there'll be an active and passive controller in the system, as well as 24 SSD drives or flash disks inside that, right? Your first upgrade as far as Capacity is going to be able to put the extra 24 drives, so this can actually hold 48 drives, and then you can add an extra storage shelf to this if you wanted to. Add an extra storage doesn't necessarily impact performance because really our performance is really locked up in our caching arch architecture or where our controllers are actually designed. But if you go beyond that, certainly there's extra storage shelves that you could put on this. Like I had mentioned, this is an active passive uh, controller model, and that's important for today's. A lot of active active controller solutions that are out there, and that really, you know, uh, what's really happening in those environments is some of the volumes are owned by one controller, and some of your volumes are owned by the other controller. And you have to manage that. You have to think about that, because if one of those two controllers fails for any reason, right, the surviving controller maintains performance within that environment, or could have significant uh, degradation of performance, because now it needs to support double the performance. And if you think about it, we're failing over controllers more and more often, not because the hardware fails, but really because if we have to do firmware upgrades or software upgrades, right, there's a lot of security issues that are out there that require us to kind of do upgrades or, or stay one step ahead or increase performance within the environment, right? So being able to do that seamlessly within a nimble environment um, it has uh, goes a long way as far as maintaining uh, your application availability. Now, this is a series of AF series, so we've got from the, the AF20 all the way up to the AF80, and as you go up the stack, you increase performance within your environment. 
So one thing that's sure is certainly Nimble's not going to paint you in any corner as far as performance. The first thing you could do if you wanted to, you could get these these head units and you could group them together in a grouping of four. So you can go two, three, and four if you wanted to. And that's one way to be able to increase performance in the environment. I see people do that sometimes. It is something that you can do if you, you get up near the top tiers. What I do you see people do is upgrade their controllers by replacing them. So for example, I told you it's an active passive model. So you have a controller that's sitting there kind of dormant. I'll pull that out and replace that. So say I, say I buy it an AF20. So I'll pull out the dormant AF20 controller, replace that with an AF40 controller, fail things over, and then replace the remaining AF20 controller with another AF40 controller. And now I have an AF40 storage system. I get the more more performance that's based on it. So I can step all the way across this. So I can start off an AF20 and grow all the way up to an AF80 if I wanted to. Right? So you're not necessarily painted in any corner as far as performance on these storage solutions. Now, as I told you, all these systems are half-populated systems, meaning they have 24 SSD drives. Your next upgrade, as far as capacity is concerned, is add the extra 24 drives. If you're looking to get into all-flash solution and, 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 and the budget is tight, you could probably start looking at an AF20Q. So an AF20Q would be a quarter-filled solution. So, so instead of 24 drives stuff, it's going to have 12 SSD drives, but it allows you to hit a certain price point within your environment. The next solution is the adaptive flash arrays, or the HF series, or what I'd say is the hybrid flash arrays. Again, these are using, uh, these are spinning disk solutions that use just enough SSD disk to get you most of the performance that you'd see out of a, a all-flash system, right? And obviously, because we're using spinning disk, it would be at a, at a different cost metric or a lower cost metric. Now, what's new with these systems, as I mentioned earlier, it was always on deduplication, so most of the models, and I'll, I'll talk about the one model that doesn't, but most of the models will have compression as well as deduplication, so it matches the capabilities that we've had for years in the all-flash systems. So these systems are certainly screaming fast. Um, they certainly allow you uh, higher capacities, because obviously spinning disks have bigger capacities than flash disks. Right? So if capacity is your game, then, then adaptive flash array might be, might be what you want to look at. The same story is true, so I could start off on an HF20 and replace the controllers and grow this guy all the way up to an HF60 if I wanted to. Um, these guys have the ability to hold six extra storage shelves, so a tremendous amount of capacity, especially when we look at spinning disk capacities. Now, there's a couple systems that I want you to be aware of. There's an HF20C, so if you know your environment will not have any benefit out of using due duplication at all and those environments exist and people who who know their environments you know they, they know whether or not deduplication works and right? if you're one of those people out there you can buy a compression only and capture back those few cpu cycles if you've wanted to now if price again is the game for you guys you guys want to get into a nimble array right you need a starting place that's where the hf 20h would fit in so it'd be a half populated so all these systems are filled with spinning disks except for the hf uh, 20h that would be half populated allowing you again get in these solutions at a reduced price point Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the app data gap, right? We want to get to our applications, right? Mainly, you want to get it to our applications because they produce the data that we've collected on the back end, right? And if there's any type of latency within that environment, any type of issues, we call that the app data gap. And I'll actually say, you know, what's what's really difficult in an environment is, say, say a resource or, or something that you use within your your business that that creates money. If that if that's that's down, that's a bad day right but sometimes it's more frustrating if it half works right it's going real slow be able to figure out where those problems are and i usually relate this maybe like to 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 your your car if your car is broken usually the auto mechanic can go in and go figure out what's what's wrong with it right away and fix it but if the car kind of hesitates stalls out sometimes doesn't work they have a harder time figuring out what's going on they may even say hey bring me back that back um when the car is exhibiting these issues so i can look into that right until today now we have a computer computer chips on cars and people can uh, go into those computer chips and get telemetry from those. Well, we've been collecting telemetry data on storage systems for a long time or they have that built kind of in, right? What the app, da what closing the app data get just allows us to be able to, what it should do for us is be able to reach into that data and be able to connect the dots in a big data fashion, right? So certainly Nimble does that with something we call InfoSight. 
So InfoSight has reached into the storage systems that are out there. It was collecting data from these storage systems. And what they've realized that realistically speaking, right, when you're having performance issues on a network, right, it's not really the storage system. Right? More often than not, it's configuration issues, interoperability issues. They're not using best practice. You know, host compute or, or resources, your virtualization stack, how is that working? Right? But being able to figure that out is, is what's, what's really, really difficult in the environment. Now, I've been a VMware administrator since, since VMware uh, vSphere 3 was out, and I've actually been doing VMware a little bit longer. And I'll tell you that certainly VMware has a lot of performance statistics that it'll, that it'll give you, but being able to analyze those statistics and figure out what's going on, you almost need a rocket scientist to be able to do that. Right? And there are some big, expensive programs that are out there that allow you to analyze that and, and figure that out. But we actually have something called InfoSight. So InfoSight it's a predictive analytics tool, tool that allows you to be able to close the updated gap. It exists in the cloud, right? And if you choose to, you can allow your your uh, telemetry from your sources. Now, I'm not talking about any of your, any of your databases or any of your, your Word documents or spreadsheets or like that. Just the sensor data that's coming from the Nimble system gets passed up into InfoSight in the cloud. It allows us to be able to do cross-stack telemetry or evaluate that with the sensor data that you get out of your storage system. System, as well as with your virtualized environment and probably and, and allow you to be able to connect the dots, right? It's global learning. You can look at these storage systems across the board and be able to analyze what's going on and, and do analytics based on that and, and replace things based on, on best practices. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. Nimble looked out there and based on the big data analytics that they were doing, their, their artificial intelligence in the cloud, they determined that if they tweaked their compression code, that people could have a significant impact as far as performance as well as data reduction in there. And they looked out in the, with InfoSight, they looked out there and they determined who was using these type of applications. Right? And they said, hey, would you like to try this out? Right? And they've applied that, that firmware to their storage systems. Right? They made the recommendation realized it was it was really good and they passed it out to the great masses or we could look at reverse that in reverse say you're stuck on an older version of vmware for one reason or another right or, or your virtualization stack Right. They had the ability to go in and look, say, hey, the people who are using this older version of virtualization, right? they weren't benefiting out of the enhancements out of this firmware. Right? So we're not necessarily going to pass that down the environment. Right? It allows you to be able to have cases open and closed before issues happen. For example, there was a manufacturing defect with the, in some of the power supplies. Right? They were able to go out, and before it even became a problem, it, they didn't know if these power supplies were going to fail or not, but they realized there could be a potential issue. They went out, used their big data analytics, picked out when the power supplies were manufactured and for how long they were manufactured, found them out there, and automatically opened case and sent out new power supplies and had them replaced within the, in the environment. Right? And that happened without any user interaction in that environment or, or without users having to know about that and, and read some type of, uh, of alert that came through email. Right? On an older system that's been running for a long, long time, I had an SSD drive failed. Right? A case was opened on my behalf, right? and a drive was shipped out without any user interaction. And that happens through InfoSight. Now, I know that talking about uh, analytics and, and software and things like that, that can be a little bit abstract. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to break away and I'm going to give you a little demonstration on InfoSight. So let me, let me back out of here and let me open up. So, so I'm logged into InfoSight. Again, this is a cloud resource. You can see I'm logged into InfoSight.hpe.com. And this is the operational dashboard. Or this is where, where if you adopt the solution, where you, you'll land, land is for when you log into this environment. So I'm managing two arrays, right? And I'm getting heartbeats from these two arrays. I can tell that, that a lot of my volumes are protected, but I need to go look in to see who is not using their protection schemes or their snapshotting schedules. And I can also see if there's any critical capacity issues that are happening here. Finally, I get to see top virtual machines. Who are the heavy, heavy hitters as far as virtual machines in the environment? And I can, every, all this is all clickable. I can click on this, click on that, right? We can even click on this virtual machine. And in a second, we'll see this populate within the environment. We can see CPU count, memory count, the capacity that's being utilized, what's allocated, as well as important uh, performance numbers such as latency, IOPS, as well as throughput. And I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in a little bit. So we are in the operational 
uh, dashboard. Now I'm going to move over and we're going to actually look at the executive dashboard next. So this is something that you, you'd, you'd send out to your executive team. You could certainly email this. You could print it if you wanted to, or you could export this. So what type of information do I get here? Well, within my, my environment, I'm getting a space savings of about four to one. And again, that's for every one terabyte I have, it's acting like a little more than four terabytes of space. So how am I getting that space efficiency in the environment? So the world thinks I'm using about 10 terabytes, right? But I'm saving about three and a third due to compression, about two terabytes due to clones, and about two and three quarters due to deduplication. And what I'm actually using on the back end storage is a little more than two and a half terabytes. Right, and I can visualize that very quickly. If I go down, we can see the cases that have been open and closed on, on my behalf. And you can see 94% of them has been open and closed without any human interaction. Right. Go down even further. Data protection, what's my recovery point objective? Now, I certainly need to be a little bit more aggressive, but I like to let you guys come in and kind of configure these rep recovery point objectives. So I have some that are set for an hour, some that are set for a day. So this is how often I'm taking snapshots and a bunch of them that are not being scheduled. So I got to look into those, right? Next is the local retention. How long am I hanging on to these snapshots? Some of them are for 90 days. And I can look down below and look at the uh, default categories that are that they're set for as well. Right, some VDI, some normal VMware or Windows systems. And then finally, we can see over here, some of my um, retaining snapshots for 52 weeks. Going on even below, we've got disaster recovery. So I'm doing most of mine through, through local snapshots. Again, I got a lot of unprotected that I need to look into. And nothing that's replicated. I like to leave this open because if you guys like to engage with me, I'll certainly show you how to do that site-to-site -site replication type of, type of technology. We can show you how replication works. Next on the chart going over is the wellness. So if anything was standing out, I'd look in here and I'd be able to tell if there's something going on. Next, we'll look at capacity. So what's my capacity utilization inside this environment? Now we're gonna be looking at pools of storage from the get-go. Remember I said you could group controller nodes together, head nodes together, and up to four nodes. That would be what a pool is. And I'm looking at my pools. Now I have pools of one in my environment, but, but we could see the usage, right? And we're looking at based on pools down here. Right, we get a quick view into what's going on, growth patterns. We can look at based on the applications. I don't know, you can see most things are trending down. Or even on the individual volumes inside this environment. Right. And also, there's, there's finally, there's, there's labs. These are things that they'd like you to kick the tires on. Obviously, these are beta enhancements into InfoSight that you could use and, and see if you'd like. All right, so, so that's the dashboard. All right, next we'll go over to infrastructure. Certainly we've got storage under here, so we'll start again the pools. Again, those are the grouping of arrays together um, that enhance performance. And I've got a couple pools and we'll grab, maybe we'll grab this one here. Now I'm looking at the overview. Now the nice thing about this is it's gonna predict my storage utilization over time or forecast. There's not a lot going on here, but you know, moving forward, I can also see how firmware updates have had an impact. So something happened here as far as this firmware update that impacted my CPU saturation. All right. I can look here as well as here for my updates. Right. And actually, you can look at performance. And it takes a little bit, but this will pop you. I can change my metrics. So I could do one day, one month three months or a custom view into this environment, right? And here's, here's my performance. So we can look at IOPS latency as well as throughput. And then we can go dig into capacity as well. So we get those, those views as, as capacity as well as what, what it feels I'm going to utilize over time. So it looks like I'm going to be pretty flat in this environment. So those are pools. I can also look at the individual arrays themselves. So it's going to look similar because um, my arrays have, have oh, my pools have one array in their pool, but a little bit different view into the environment. I can also grab the volumes look at the volumes individually all right so quickly i can tell this one's got a red line on it so i might want to dig in on this guy here all right and again look at things you know what's the application category how much is this volume being utilized is it deduplication enabled and i can see that again latency iops as well as throughput for this Right. And again, I could get a view into the capacity as well. And how's my storage? So understanding where my storage capacity is and how much is getting utilized is very important. So if you looked at, you know, following along, I can look at the grouping of storage systems together, the individual storage systems, as well as the volumes as far as metrics within this environment.
All right, so let's go look. Let's go to the next step on our journey to cross stack telemetry. So let's go back up the infrastructure and let's look at the virtualization layer. So if you choose to have the virtualized environment, send its telemetry up. You can do that as well. And look at things based on a VMware data center. I could certainly click on cluster host or data source, and that just bring me across this view. So I'm just going to move across. We're going to look at the clusters themselves. Now we're going to let this populate. Now I can see this is what the host performance is acting like. So what, what are my CPUs running at? What's my memory running at? Right across this cluster, as well as this cluster here. Right, and I could select individual ESX systems. So I'll select this guy over here. If you notice, our context changed over here, and I can see host performance over time. Right. 5% ready, usage, swap file, as well as balloon information, which is sometimes very important. That could change the amount of time that I'm looking at. But next, we can look at the data stores. So we had volumes on the storage system, but this is the telemetry that VMware is collecting about the performance within its environment. Right? But you can see these are all the volumes I have presented to the VMware environment, and I could dig, in, dig into one of these, and we'll take this guy right here maybe. And we're going to look at the store at the performance capacity of this VMFS volume. This is the version of VMFS that's running block size and usage and what's allocated and things like that. We've got latency, IOPS, as well as throughput here. We can also look at capacity. What's my capacity utilization over time of this? And we can see I, I should turn on storage I/O control at some point. All right, so this is going to populate in a second, and we can see our capacity again, what my usage is, and what my total capacity of this volume would be as compared to what I'm using. Next, we could look at virtual machines. It's actual VMs that run inside this environment. So these are all the virtual machines. And I can dig into these virtual machines. Let's select the pretty good one here. Here, let's grab this guy. All right, and now I'm going to get CPU count, memory count of the virtual machine, usage, what's allocated, all right, average IOPS, latency, and we can get a graph of that down below. All right. And we can look at the capacity. And again, this is the capacity of the of the virtual machine itself. We can see there's been a spike that happened here at some point in time. All right, and finally, so you could have one virtual hard drive attached to a virtual machine, or you could have multiple virtual hard drives. In VMware, we call these VMDKs, so I have one virtual hard drive. But if you had multiple virtual hard drives, I could actually dig into those right, and get the performance metrics of individual virtual hard drives in this environment. Again, we can see the size, average IOPS. Again, this, this is a virtual hard drive. So the story I'm telling here is you could look at a virtual hard drive. You could look at the virtual machine. You could look at the cluster, the data center, and then you can start looking at the storage side, looking at the volumes, right? look at the array, and then the grouping of arrays together. And this is the cross-stack telemetry that, they, that, that, uh, um, that InfoSight offers. And, and this gives you great reporting, allows you to be able to dig in when you're having issues within your virtualized environment and be able to figure out where the problems are happening in a quick fashion. And some people pay a lot of money for these type of, type of virtualization pieces. Now, something that you should be aware of, and something that's new, if you have ProLiant servers, ProLiant servers are also passing telemetry. Now we have a crawl one, uh, we have a crawl walk run mentality. So right now we're just collecting the telemetry from your systems, but it allows you to be able to dig in and quickly get information such as the generations of your servers, if any of them are out of warranty support. But you can dig in, get some great information about these ProLiant servers. So we'll select a nice Gen 10 server, and we'll dig into that. And we could see well, if there's any wellness alerts, event logs, right? the actual hardware that's configured in the servers, right? as far as processor, memory. And this is available to you now right? if you're using ProLiant server technology. All right, so that's a quick overview on InfoSight. All right, so again, that's this cross-stack telemetry, the global learning, the, your, your uh, 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 artificial intelligence, your big database artificial intelligence that exists within the cloud. All right, so this is the storage portfolio overview. This is kind of my last slide. So certainly we have the all the all flash arrays. So these are our nimble storage systems that are built on SSD systems. They're easy and simple and very efficient to be able to configure in your environment. All right, I would evaluate those first and then let your budget kind of dictate as to whether or not you look at the hybrid flash arrays. Again, these are using um, just enough flash disks or SSD disks to be able to give you most of the performance you get in all flash array on a spinning disk system. So you can choose those. Either one of these systems has the ability to be used as, as secondary storage or backup targets for your backup software in your environment. And certainly a lot of them can reach in and be able to provide you with the ability to do instant 
with virtual machine recoveries. Something I didn't have a slide on, but I think you should be aware of is, is HPE cloud volumes. And this is the ability to have a nimble storage system in the cloud. And I can replicate my local nimble storage system to something that exists within the cloud. And then if something disastrous happens, I could take that storage and attach it to, to AWS or Azure if you needed to. And then finally, the icing on the cake of this solution is InfoSight, being able to get the cross-stack analytics, be able to dig in and be able to figure out where you're having problems, to be able to analyze the storage and understand how it reacts based on the virtualization environment and be able to quickly go in and make changes or, or understand how your, your storage is being utilized within your environment. So, so that's everything for me. I'm going to pass it back on over to Rob so he can, he can close this up. Okay, um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Okay, um, what type of replication does Nimble provide? All right, so so today Nimble provides uh, asynchronous based replication. So so on an ongoing basis, um, you know your data it exists at your main site. You'll get that kind of kind of copied over to secondary site, and, and at an interval that you pick, it'll take a snapshot of the data and then send over the deltas to the secondary site. Something that you're probably going to see uh, pretty soon coming out is going to be synchronous replication, which will be um, as bits and bytes change at the main site, those will automatically get sent over to a secondary. Site. So, so a lot of people tend to want that, but but usually they back back off based on their bandwidth considerations and latency. You, you, you don't want to be able to do that in any storage system out there. You need high bandwidth and low latency to be able to be able to do something like that. But it, those are the two di different types of replication that are available or, or will be available with Nimble today. It's it's asynchronous. Uh, I've heard of a controller refresh program before with Nimble. Could you go over the support options? Um, and kind of what all is entailed to get uh, uh, a new set of controllers. It's based off the ability to kind of do that in-step upgrade of controllers. So again, it's an active-passive model. Right? If you got the dormant controller there, you pull that controller out, replace it with a newer controller, kind of step your your way on up. That's all I know from it here, but I'll certainly take that and, and set it aside and, and do a little little more research on it, pass that along to Rob. I don't know if you know a little bit more about that, if, if you guys have utilized that or not. I believe, and, and we will correct us if I'm wrong here, but I believe that if you do have uh, active support um, and the current generation of controllers has, let's say, gone out of date, they will give you an, an not necessarily an upgrade, so you wouldn't go from uh, a, a, a 40 series to a 60 series, but whatever the next generation of controllers is, you do get that at, at no cost. So um, I know we've had a couple of customers take advantage of that. And uh, next one here, is there the ability to tweak settings both at a server and a storage level to fine tune the devices and then see the results in InfoSight? And I uh, asked this person to, to clarify and, I, um, and um, by tweaking, are, are we talking about uh, changing quality of service or volume settings and then uh, seeing that in InfoSight? So kind of what's the relationship to making changes in the um, storage management interface and then seeing that in InfoSight. So yeah, absolutely. You, you'll you'll you you can make changes inside the storage management interface. Now, InfoSight isn't your best metrics for for instant on the spot type of type of things. It's going to be within the Nimble interface itself. But if you're looking for for analytics over time or how you're trending, um, it, it's good to use InfoSight. InfoSight's updates happen every couple hours, every few hours. It, it sends telemetry on there, so so it might be a little stale as you kind of look at it, but it still gives you an idea. But can you make a change like like enable or disable? Able deduplication and see that impact in the cloud. Absolutely. Can you use things like uh, um, uh, limiting performance inside the uh, doing the uh, the I/O control and see that impact in the cloud? Absolutely. You can do those things. Okay. We got one more question here. Um, oh, this uh, we might have got that a little earlier. Um, are there any other HP products that uh, we can use InfoSight? Uh, we talked about. Um, uh, HP servers, uh, ProLiant servers, and I believe uh, we can also, um, uh, the three-part platform is using InfoSight. Uh, John, are there any other platforms other than uh, uh, Nimble, 3PAR, and ProLiant that can use InfoSight today? 
Yeah, um, another one would be their D to D disk space backup system, um, which would be store once. So that would be like your yeah, backup right. targets for your Veeam and things like that. They also have their own uh, uh, type of uh, a recovery application. That's how they're called recovery management it's central and that also report as well. All right. So yeah, you, I think you hit them all. It's ProLiant, uh, three power, nimble, uh, store once, as well as uh, recovery manager central. Okay, well, it looks like that is, those are all the questions that we had. Um, and uh, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And if you do have any other questions or you would like to have a more in-depth conversation with us and or John, uh, please feel free to reach out to your account manager. Or